I wanted to talk about this disruptive nature of fin financial services in India. Everybody says it's the big thing, but what's the big deal? I believe we are in year two of a four-year window where the financial system of this country is going to change. When we're going to look back and see this point when a cash-driven, opaque, siloed, disconnected economy begins the migration to one that's digital, online, and increasingly transparent. We're going to see one where consumers and merchants have smart applications on their phones, in their pockets, running their lives and their businesses that are interconnected, talking to each other and working together in an Android-like ecosystem to deliver Uber-like customer experiences. And every citizen in this country will not only become a part of the financial and digital grid, the lives of their families will be materially better because the system itself will become more efficient and more intelligent. Now, there's going to be a lot of entities that are working together, including banks, to make this a happen. But the real engine that is driving this transformation is a new breed of software companies. And it's what makes me, as a software entrepreneur, jump out of bed every day, and I'm a privilege to be part of what's happening. Let's talk about disruption. Why does disruption happen? Disruption has two things. There's an evolutionary side of how things happen and a revolutionary side. So let's talk about evolution for a second. Evolution, to me, is a better slice of bread. Same rough business model, same network effects, same core product, but companies actually will innovate and kind of improve a certain area of how things work, and they get a competitive advantage. And many, many great companies are built this way. Disruption is something where the way the future works fundamentally changes all of the underlying assumption of how the present model works. And what happens is that business models, legacy assets, and incumbency actually becomes threatened. And in many ways, it becomes commoditized and potentially obsolete. Now, there are companies like Larry Page and Google who set out and look for the scientific vision of the future. They go and create it, and by the time they create it, it's too late for everybody else. But the reality is that most disruption happens quietly. It happens, companies are sitting there and growing. And the question then becomes, why is it that people don't see what's happening? And I believe part of the problem is they actually focus a lot on the what, that tip of the iceberg, and they miss the underlying how, the architecture of how it's actually being deployed. Let me give you two examples of how software companies have transformed old school industries. Uh, let's look at the automotive industry. Automotive industry is built on two basic models. One, me as a customer, you want me to purchase a car, maybe a fuel-efficient car when I'm in my 20s, then migrate to a family sedan when I'm a couple years later, and then, of course, after a midlife crisis, buy a sports car. So you're moving me and having me purchase new models over time. The second thing is, as each car needs service, you take it into a shop, and that's where they analyze and they fix, and that's where a lot of the profits of the industry come. Now, Tesla comes along. To them, this is an expensive car. It's an electric one, but so what? Well, now imagine if I actually had bought a car that was a sedan and fuel efficient, and instead of actually having to take it to a shop, I could let it sit in my garage, and they could sit down and analyze what's happening, and then fix everything overnight in my garage with an update of software. And then, the day I want to upgrade to a sports car, again, all they have to do is push an update to my car while it's sitting in my house, and now with the push of a button, my sedan becomes a sports car and it turns back into a sedan whenever I want to. The what was a car. The how of how software integrates everything is transformative. It potentially changes all of the underpinnings of the entire automotive industry. Let's look at another example. An example that is so ubiquitous in how we live our everyday lives that we sometimes forget why it's so disruptive. And it's an example of a company in a sector that most closely mirrors what's happening in financial services. It's how Google and Android have come to dominate telecommunications, and more importantly, how actually Indians communicate. So let's look at the telecom industry. For many, many years, we had landline telephones. And then there was a point in time when we had disconnected telephones, mobile telephones. And the business model and value proposition of all of this was around quality of service and cost per transaction. Now, ultimately, when mobile phones came along, they talked about a mobile revolution, but actually the underlying business model was still the same. It was about just getting phones into people. Yes, we increased availability, but we were still doing the same thing. Evolution. Now, Google comes along. Now, take a look at these two screens. That's the call screen on Android. The what? Now, if you're an operator or if you're a Nokia, you look at this and say, so what? It's just another flavor of what we already do. And you actually ignore how it actually works underneath. 
The reality is, as Android started penetrating and we had more and more phones, you started creating a smart connected network. And the value proposition of what was in your pocket wasn't about telephone calls. It was about mini computers. It was about a universe where applications could come down to my phone. It was a way where everything was talking to itself. And the bigger that it got, the more powerful it became. It became a place where I could actually see where people were at any given time. It was a place where data was moved to the cloud. And then people could use that data to kind of change my life. Now, it is a little bit scary to think that somebody knows so much about me that they can give me a real-time offer. Yes, but you know what? It's the world we live in. It's where the world's going. And by the way, as a father, if I know where my son is at any given time, or if I know that a relative wearing a Fitbit is having a heart attack, or maybe something more fun, if something on my wish list is now immediately available for sale near me, would you like that? Of course. There are positive things that happen when this is, pro this is done correctly. If you understand Android, you all understand the foundation of the revolution that's happening in financial services. How does credit cards and payments work? For many, many decades, there were landline terminals that were connected that processed payments. Then, a disconnected mobile version came on, but ultimately it was about processing the same credit card payments. Then, you started to see smart applications. And again, look at that screen. Enter in an amount, process a payment. Is this starting to look familiar? This is what's happening. Now, again, you look at that screen and you say, okay, I don't get it, what's the big deal? But what happens when all of the merchant networks and consumers now actually are processing not through direct connectivity but on the cloud? Well, you get things like this. This is a screenshot of how Uber works. I think the best consumer and payment experience in the world. Now, there's a couple interesting things about this experience. There's a smart application that changes the user experience and makes that business run way more efficiently than any way uh, a business was run in the past. Number two. All types of payments are integrated and accepted. It's not just about we accept this, but we don't accept this. They can accept anything and turn on new forms of payments very, very easily, and most importantly, inside the application. Third, in this experience, they can do magical things. They can actually ping somebody else. First of all, they can ping a map and see where you are and where your taxi is and create a great user experience that way. But they can also ping your credit card balance and say, hey, you don't have enough money. Why don't you, again, inside my application, uh, top up your amount. In fact, with all of this data and transaction history, they could say, you know what, don't even worry about it, we know you. Here's a 2,000 rupee credit, just get out of the cab and we'll take care of it later. You start to see the network effect of all of these things happening. And there's one really important point. If this is the way that the world is going, with smart applications, Uber-like customer experiences, that middle screen, companies and entities that process payments like that can support it. Companies and entities that support the infrastructure, the bottom of the iceberg, like they do on the left side, can never support this. This is a game changing. That left side of that slide is gonna be out of business in this new world. The middle ones, doesn't matter whether it's a single screen or inside applications, is gonna be the engine that powers how all of this stuff works. Let's take a look at four fundamental principles that are happening here that actually are the basis of what we just talked about. Number one, you're gonna have availability and distribution of applications a merchant and a consumer running their business, not separating payments from something else, but actually having that all integrated. Number two, how do we have interconnectivity of all of these things working together? Uber would not be Uber if it could not talk to a credit card payment system and if it couldn't update or top up your balance or if it couldn't see where your taxi is. So an interconnected world. Number three, all of this data moving to the cloud to be used by an application for other things, like I said, the credit example, or between two completely disconnected companies. If I know this much about you, how can we change the future of lending and credit? I may not do it, but somebody else can, and all of this is now online and instantaneously available. And four, a new set of components that are all available to everybody. It's not just the big companies, but two kids will have access to things like, how do I identify who you are? How do I transfer money seamlessly at almost no cost? How do I get your uh, consent to do something? And how do I access paperwork without having to send somebody there? These are core components of something called the India stack, which is very organic to this country. In fact, we are at the complete leading edge of this. And now when you think about those core components that I talked about, most of the friction in the financial system, when you even get over the hurdle of this, whether somebody is credit worthy or whether I want to accept payment from them, comes from the slowness and the inertia of going through this absolutely mind-numbing process. But if we can take all of these components and make them instantaneous and online and retail and uh, in real time, you will accelerate the pace of innovation because you've taken all of the underlying friction out. 
The last time something like this happened, one component was exposed by the US government. It was called GPS. But what came out of that were driverless cars, maps, taxi services. Can you imagine what's going to happen when all of these are released into the wild by a single government in a single sector? So let's take a look at today and the future. The existing system is siloed, it's manual, it's inefficient, it's disconnected. I think all of us know that. But let's use a case of how this might impact the lives, not just of you or me or a business, but a farmer or a driver. You know, there was a study once, somebody was telling me that, um, forget all of the financial data, one of the best indicators of why, of when somebody's gonna be able to repay a loan regularly is their stability in a location. If somebody is in a location for a consistent amount of time, they're actually more credit worthy than you think. But think about a driver, a driver gets paid regularly, they actually have many, many transactions. They pay money for cooking cylinder gas. They pay money for all kinds of goods and services. And for the most part, many of these people are in a single place. Why are they not able to walk in and get a loan? Think about a bank. Even if some of these transactions are happening, one side of the bank has no idea what the other side is doing. It's all completely siloed. And by the time you actually want to use that and process it, it's mind-numbingly long for that person. And as we all know, there's a huge class of people that not only have a financial profile, are credit worthy, we know that they actually are probably more credit worthy than most of the people who are getting loans. The non-performing assets are much lower for the se sector of people. So what do we do? What's the world gonna look like? So now you've got the same thing happening, but now you've actually spread mobile penetration and you have consumers and merchants interacting with phones. You still have the same transactions and you still have the banks underneath, but now what happens is, you remember Google? Now we slide in a new financial operating system in this country, and these are software companies. Consumer instruments talking to consumer operating systems or engines, and merchants talking to merchant operating, and these working together. These software companies together, number one, will streamline and consolidate and accelerate all of the transactions. But number two, all of this now becomes online. So you truly have an interconnected financial system, driven by software companies sitting between the merchants and consumers and ultimately where the money goes. This is what is disruptive about the financial services sector in India, and the companies you hear about, the ones that are growing very fast now, are sitting there in that middle layer, or they are reinventing what's happening on the core side of things. And ultimately, this is the near future. These type of use cases that are transforming lives are in process today. The technology is there, and all we need to do is scale, and it is scaling. And as I said with Google, the more you use it and the wider it becomes, the more powerful all of this stuff gets. So now you're gonna have a world where applications can talk to applications in real time. But you know, if you think about the Uber example I said before, Uber works really well because Uber has an application on the driver and Uber owns the application with the consumer. So they're able to do this. But what about a world where you don't want to have to go to that level of ownership? Not everybody's Uber. How do we create a world where one application or one company can pay another one without ever having to shake hands or touch? That system is happening. So any app can pay any merchant without any work. And you're gonna have data driving credit anywhere. And in fact, you need not have the physical last mile per se. You could actually take this financial profile and let people analyze it and generate a loan from anywhere using that. Three use cases, and these are all gonna be happening very, very soon. The, one of the big drivers of Adar was how do we uh, improve and optimize how the LPG cooking cylinders are distributed. As I said, every household, big or small, urban or not urban, gets cooking cylinders. And they pay money. And what they did was they said, number one, we want to make sure that this delivery is done through an application. So we're going to track every delivery. And we're going to see not just cash, but every digital instrument, and hopefully eventually they start paying not with cash, but ultimately you're starting to see all of these people in their transactions. You also see where they are. Now, as all of this transaction data gets into the cloud, you can actually see micro lending. This is potentially disruptive to the microfinance institution. The core assets were how do I get many, many people into the field to analyze this data? Well, now the data is online and available to everybody. And not only can you analyze and say, I want to give this person a loan based on a financial profile that's growing, you can actually distribute it at almost no cost and get all the paperwork done very quickly, paying at the pump. This is a imaginative world. How do we make Uber-like experience happen in the most mundane areas? When I drive into a car, what if the person could pump gas into my car? The moment the pump goes back 
Why can't I get a message on my phone? On any app, it could be Messenger, it could be anything. One click, the money gets transferred and I drive off. That's happening. And that's actually gonna happen more quickly here in India than probably anywhere else. And then even the nature and nuance of credit might change. Right now, I gotta go in with my triplicate copies of paper and I gotta apply for a loan and I probably, if I wanna make a big purchase, need to do it before I actually wanna make that purchase. What if, based on the profile data, I know this transaction is happening. I know your driver is gonna go buy a two-wheeler. And I know based on all, what he's already seen that he's pre-approved for this. Instead of doing a loan offline and before a transaction, knowing what you need, what if you could do a loan and give credit in the middle of a process without the person even asking for it? This system, again, it all is built on one side of the financial system scaling and coming online and everybody talking together, and this can happen. And this is the future of the world and actually um, something that's exciting.